Acts 28. He's sitting up in prison. He's on house arrest, and so he's writing uh, this letter. We're going to actually be introduced this morning to the guy that actually took the letter back to Philippi, back to the church that was in the city of Philippi, um, that has this, this letter we have that we call Philippians. And we're going to be introduced to him, and we're going to see another guy in here that we're going to talk about this morning, as well as Timothy, uh, one of Paul's close associates that he ministers with. And but So we're going to finish up chapter 2. Um, there's, uh, just pay attention as we go down through this from 17 down through 30. There are going to be three different guys that we're going to kind of look at this morning. Um, and we, we see some things said about a couple of them in here. We're going to talk about Paul a little bit. Uh, but So starting at verse 17 of Philippians chapter 2, Paul is going to compare his sacrifice to the Lord as a drink offering. If anybody uh, knows anything about a drink off- offering, it is one of the sacrifices that uh, the nation of Israel was given. Along, and not a lot of times they would pour out uh, maybe a, about a pint worth of wine over top the sacrifice morning and evening sacrifice. And so Paul's alluding to that. He's suggesting that he, he himself is a drink offering that's being poured out. So starting here in verse 17, it says this. <clears throat> he says, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself also shall also come shortly. Yet I consider it necessary to send to you to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him to, uh, the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. And so there are three guys that we're looking at, or I'm going to look at this morning, and we're kind of do a flyover, just going to look at some brief things about their lives, because in this section here in Philippians 2, 17 through 30, Paul closes out this chapter talking about a little bit about himself. Um, what, why do you think that's important that Paul uh, refers to himself as being poured out as a drink offering? What's that, what's that telling us? What's that showing us? What's that telling us? So if you heard Chris, he said, you know, that, that Paul was willing to sacrifice his life. And that's what he's kind of suggesting here, that his life is a sacrifice. It kind of reminds me of Romans chapter 1 and 2, uh, specifically verse 2, when it talks about don't be, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed. And he's coming off of talking about it's a reasonable sacrifice or a reasonable worship, is what Paul says in Romans 1, uh, that is something that we should all uh, take part of as well. So he, yeah, he's referring to uh, this sacrifice as this offering unto God. He kind of su- suggests that, there is, that it's connected kind of in some way to that. Um, and so what I want to do this morning is look at Paul's life. I want to look at Timothy's life. And I want to look at Epaphroditus' life. That's a hard one to say, Epaphroditus. I actually had to look at him up and pl- play how you say that a couple times. <laughs> how do you say this guy's name? Paul and Timothy's pretty easy, but his name is Epaphroditus. Is another gentleman that we saw here at the very end of this section in Philippians chapter 2. But I want to start with Paul first. I want to start with uh, one of the verses that's pretty popular. It's a, a verse that we kind of put to memory. Imitate me as I imitate Christ or follow me as I follow Christ. It's going to be on the screen there. So, most of the translation tells us that it says to imitate Paul just as he also imitates Christ. I got up there that the King James Version will actually say, follow me as I follow Christ. It's something that's similar to imitating. 
And so what is it about Paul's life that we're to imitate? Think about Paul for a second. What, what is it that his, life is, um, that his life is displaying for us based off of his following of Jesus Christ? What, what, how, so if you, if you were to say that I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to take this to heart, I'm going to do as Paul says, what would you think would be being played out in your life? So if you guys heard what Rod said, it was really good there, just talking about being, having a, a life of a sacrifice. Um, the, chances of us, um, the chances of us actually ex- experiencing what Rod was talking about, uh, w- you know, when he was stoned a number of different times, he was beat with whips a number of different times. He was, I mean, Paul goes through a list in the Bible talking about all the different things that he went through. And so the, the reality is, I mean, we're not going to experience that, most likely. Now, I don't know what's going to happen over the next couple of years. I mean, there's, I mean I've, I've read some things and listened to some folks that kind of suggest that we may have a difficulty, we might have a difficult uh, way of living our lives uh, here in America, probably here in the near future, if things begin, begin to go uh, south or whatever uh, in our country. Um, so we, might, we may have to do that. But uh, by and large, we don't really suffer persecution, not at the same level that Paul do, does or did. Um, most likely even Timothy. Actually, I didn't, well, Trace, you read something. I didn't realize this about Timothy. She was reading something last night. Was it out of the Fox's Book of the Martyrs? If you guys, if, I don't know if you guys have that book. It's a really, it's a, it's a good book to, to have, a, uh, to have uh, that looks at uh, the different martyrs. But Timothy was what? He was beaten with, with clubs, I think, is, is, if you read in there, uh, that he infuriated some people. He was speaking about holiness and uh, living a right kind of a life, so he infuriated, infuriated a number of different people. And they beat him with clubs, and he succumbed to that beating within a couple of days. And so Timothy would know a little something you know, about what Paul's talking about. The same thing here with Epaphroditus. If you notice there at the end of uh, chapter 2, uh, it, it was talking about how he almost died for the gospel's sake, that he almost... Uh, gave his life uh, for serving Jesus and to sharing Jesus with other people. And, and so Paul makes mention of that as he writes back here to, to Philippians. But this, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. What are some other things that you could be have in your life that would imitate Paul, that Paul would basically tell us, a good, hey, you know, you're doing a good job? Rod, Rod gave the example of, of um, having sacrificing, you know, all the way to the, to the point of being hurt. That's what Paul did. So Mike said that he was a single-minded guy. If you um, so, if you think about that, that's what, I mean. That's really if you study Paul's life from Acts 13 down to Acts 28 in the in the in the Acts of the Apostles, um, he was single-minded. That was his main purpose. He was totally. I mean, he was totally given over to Jesus and the things of Christ. And he, um, beatings and being stoned and other types of persecutions didn't do anything uh, to stop him or slow him down. It just really, I think, it enhanced his ministry that he uh, would say basically in one of, the, one of the places in the Bible he's talking about uh, that, that it's a benefit to us that when we go through sufferings that, that we're going to have to suffer for Christ's name. So I think it's something that Mike brings up sometimes. You know, in his study in Philippians chapter 1, at the beginning of this uh, letter, in verse 29, that, that we are going to have to go through sufferings. And, and the Bible also talks about uh, that um, all of us that live, our desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So if you're li- desiring to live godly for Jesus, you know, there can be difficult. Who, who's, ever, who's experienced some difficulties for Christ? Yeah? You don't know? You don't think so? Yeah, well, the thing, and the thing, yeah, kind of what Megan said, not as bad as Paul. I mean, very few people would suffer the way that Paul uh, suffered. I mean, they're living in an environment, unlike the environment that we live in, where Christianity is just kind of like, you know, winked at or whatever here. Um, you, might get, you might get some people yelling at you or, 
uh, or, or if you say you're working with some people that, that may not like you, you're, maybe you put a Bible verse up in your cubicle and somebody might have a, a comment. I've had, I've had a couple of comments when I was working down at Frederick where, where people would call me you know, a holy roller or something, but that wasn't really persecution. I mean, I, they, they, were, they, didn't, they meant something bad by it, but um, I, I don't necessarily felt like I was persecuted, like what Megan says, in, in the same level <clears throat> that Paul's going through that. But, so the, one of the things that, that I, I really like about Paul is that one verse that he uh, is known for saying there in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 that we just looked at, is that we're to imitate him just as he imitates Christ. And so the same way that Jesus ministered uh, to, uh, to the people here on this earth for three and a half years, Paul is mimicking uh, that, which uh, he is, um, how, how he's living his life. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, and there's a couple places in here, I'm going to, once I get to Timothy as well, but I'm going to, I'm going to look, we're going to look at Paul's life, is some things that, um, that, that we could see in his life that he was given over to. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, it says this. It says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So I, already, I quoted that verse 12 just a few seconds ago. Um, that if you have a, why, why is it that you're, you're going to have persecution if you do, uh, live a godly life? And So actually what I think Tracy said, it's in John, I think that's John 15, where Jesus basically says, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you as well. Could you make this argument? This is a pretty tough, this can be tough to hear. If we're not receiving persecution, could, it, could an argument be made that we're not living a godly life? Think about that for a second. If we're not actually experiencing a level of persecution, the question we could ask ourselves is, am I living a kind of a life that's going to draw the attention of other people? Um, I'm telling you right now, if, if, you, if you start taking your Bible study seriously, your time in God's Word seriously, if you start taking prayer seriously, if you start, start taking fellowship with the, the saints, I mean, this is right here, what we do on Sunday mornings is vitally important. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I believe in God, but I don't really have a, a use for the church. I would challenge somebody that would say that and ask them to examine their own faith because their, their, their faith may not be a genuine faith. Because when Jesus saves people, if you, if you remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, it said the Lord was uh, saving daily those who were being saved and bringing them into the church. Whenever you're, like when Buzzy is, if, if Buzzy's been saved, and we're praying and hoping that that's exactly what God did yesterday, he's going to have some, some natural, it's going to be some kind of like a desire to be around other Christian people. He's going to have a desire to listen to what Nancy might have, his wife might have to say, about the things of the Lord. That's one of the evidences that's in our life, is if we, um, have, we enjoy, we want to be around one another, because this is where our gifts are used. The gifts that God gives each one of us, for everybody that's a believer in Jesus Christ, has at least one gift, and that gift is, des is designed, Ephesians 4 talks about, ministering to the rest of the body. But we see here that, uh, that when Paul was writing Timothy and 2 Timothy, Paul talking about his life, I want to kind of look down through that list, and just to kind of talk about that stuff briefly. So there in 2 Timothy 3 it says, but you, have care but you have carefully followed my doctrine. What does he mean by doctrine? You have carefully followed my doctrine. Teaching. Is it his doctrine or is it God's doctrine? Or is it both? Actually, I think, that, yeah, I like that word that you used. She said it was the correct doctrine. We know in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, All scripture has been given by inspiration. God is profitable for doctrine. So a doctrine is, a, is an important thing. Um, how, how important is doctrine to be for, for proper doctrine in the church? How important is that? So I actually, I brought this up last, I don't know if anybody cringed when I said it, or I, I may not have explained it uh, very well, but when I said that women aren't allowed to be pastors, I mean, who would, who's in agreement with that? 
And this is not something I've made up. I'm not like trying to pick on Megan and say, hey, you know, Megan can't, she can't minister here within the body. The reality is the Bible talks about that in First Timothy, uh, as well as in, in First Corinthians. I think it's in Fort, what's that? In Titus as well, but or Second Timothy chapter three, when you look at what the requirements are for an elder or for a bishop, the leadership of the church, uh, Paul's talking to man, he's talking to a man. It's, it's a, all you can tell as he, as you read down through Second Timothy three and Titus one that he's talking to men. So that doesn't mean that women aren't good with good. I mean good for anything. They are. I mean, you think about all the women in our church that serve on the worship team and, and serve during the food pantry and serve. Just your presence alone is service. I, I think sometimes just being around you know, people as we, uh, as we kind of grow to become closer together, that your presence, it's not that, you know, we dislike women, but that's what the, but the reality it comes down to this. That's what, just what the Bible says. And I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm just leaving it right there, I'm not gonna mess with it, uh, mess what the Bible says, and we're given that. So, a doctrine is important. What do you think Paul makes reference to when he refers to himself, his manner of life? What do you think he means by that? In 2 Timothy 3.10. His witness, what Mike said. Actually, I was thinking of what, as, uh, when you were talking, Liz, about there's, it's, a, it's in Philippians. We'll get to it probably here in the, uh, the next couple Sundays. <clears throat> but who, I don't know if you guys know, but, I mean, you think of some of the things that Paul gave up in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, he was a Fer- I mean, Pharisee. So what, what, what is so big about him being a Pharisee and him giving that up? What's that? Yeah, uh, Phil said power. I mean, you think about the. I mean, he was a young Pharisee, but he was one in training. He was trained by a very popular. What's his name? Gamma. Uh, is Gam, how you say it? You saying it? Gam, Gamiel. How you say his name? Gamiel. Uh, he was a famous rabbi, a famous Pharisee, a famous teacher, uh, and so he was spending his time uh, training Paul up in the things of the Lord. So Paul, I mean, Paul knew his Bible. He knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. That's one of the things that you'd have to be as a Pharisee, a, a student of God's Word. And so when Paul came to faith in Jesus Christ, he gave up all the comforts of life. I mean, he could have been very comfortable uh, by staying as a Pharisee, staying, staying with that elite group of men, uh, but, he, but he gave up his, his, so his manner of life was of sacrifice. What do you think it means when it says purpose? But you have carefully followed my purpose. Actually, if you remember what, like, kind of what Eric is saying, talking about there, is that the, his purpose of life, um, you know, he, uh, when he gave his life to Christ in Acts chapter, was that 9, I think it is, um, his, his kind of Damascus Road experience that he had there, uh, his purpose in life was going from trying to persecute Christians. I mean, that's what, that was, matter of fact, what he was trying to do at that time uh, in Acts chapter 9. He was with a couple people, and he was heading off. Uh, he, had, he had some letters that were given to him, giving him permission to arrest anybody that he finds that were Christians. And so he was, uh, he was found by the Lord. His, his life was radically changed and turned around. Um, and then now his purpose of life um, was to share Christ with people. And if you study Paul's life, um, there at the beginning of it, uh, the, the, the people that were in charge of the church or the leadership of the church, they were kind of skeptical a little bit about Paul. And, but Paul, they finally, had, they finally listened to Paul. They saw Paul's life. And so finally... It talks about Peter giving him the right hand of acceptance, that he shook his hand, basically saying that we're on the same team, and Peter endorsed that uh, in Paul's life, and so Paul became a minister of Jesus Christ. And so his purpose of life now was changed from being a Pharisee, a religious person, with really no power behind what they're doing, 
uh, to a, somebody that had power. And you can look at Paul's life, like I said, through Acts 13 to 28 and see all the things that, um, that he had. What do, you, what do you think faith means? But you have carefully followed my faith. And I think some of these kind of go hand in hand. They kind of connect together. And so John said that basically it was pretty crystal clear in what Paul believed. I mean, he, he didn't hold back. Um, when, you, when you study his life, uh, like I said, in Acts, and you, go and you follow him, um, he, he was part of the faith. He, he, would, um, he would challenge us to contend for the faith in Galatians chapter 1. Um, he, uh, to, uh, you know, like if somebody would come in talking about a different Jesus, that Paul had no problem addressing it. And I think, Paul, I think Paul did it in a spirit of love as well because, remember, Paul wrote, I mean, a good majority of the New Testament. And one of the places that he talks about love is in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, where basically he is saying, you know what, if, if, you, if you don't have the love, your ministry is basically useless. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Um, and then in verse 4 of, of 1 Corinthians 13, um, Paul then talks about, you know, love is patient, love is kind, and he goes down through that list of what love is. And so I think Paul did that. He, he held the faith, um, but, um, but he also did it in love. The next word that, in that list is long-suffering. But you have carefully followed my long-suffering. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. So, so Mike brought up the, the parable, the teaching of the, uh, I call it the level of the soils, because I think the soils is what's different. But there's four levels of different soils there that, that he speaks about. He talks about it in, predominantly, I, I always look at Matthew chapter uh, 13, uh, but the different soil levels. And one of the ones is perseverance. That's one of the ways that you can determine if somebody is a genuine believer versus uh, that he's not. So if, so if we look at, we'll just, we'll just use Buzzy this morning because we've been talking about that and celebrating what God has done in his life. If Buzzy's salvation is, is a genuine salvation, he's going to persevere. Who knows it is God, for the believer, it is God that actually makes sure that he makes, he, the, the person that Buzz, like Buzzy would make it to the end. It's God doing that work in our life. We already talked about this a couple Sundays ago um, where Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, uh, we kind of already looked at this, but uh, that they, that the, the faith that we have is a faith that God will see through to the very end. We always look at Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So it's Christ who does that. So perseverance, like what Mike said, perseverance and long-suffering kind of go together. He says there, but you have carefully followed my love. What, is lo- lo- what love do you think he's talking about? You, fo- you followed my love. So what, he, what Kim said is so true. Like he had, a, he had such a love for one, for basically, he, he would inc- kind of do what Peter talks about, having fervent love for one another. That Paul had that love. I think you could also maybe add into uh, that where it says, but you've carefully followed my love, is that the love that he had for Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I was kind of trying to look that up real quick. It talks about, that the, he says, the love of Christ compels me, is what Paul says. The love of Christ compels me. That's the love that Paul would have had for Christ. That's the love that Christ had for Paul. 
Um, and just uh, before he makes that statement there in 2 Corinthians 5, at the very beginning of that place, he talks, he talks about the terror of the Lord. He's like, it's the terror of the Lord that causes me to persuade uh, people. And what he's basically talking about is that he knows what is, who knows that, who knows that you got, to, in order to share the gospel, you've got to share the bad news. Because if, if, if you just simply say, you know, Jesus loves you and he's got a purpose for your life, or Jesus, you know, he, he's, he's got plans for your life, well, those are true statements, maybe. Um, most, he does have a purpose for our life. He does love us. He does have, he, you know, he, he thinks, you know, of us as beloved children. But the reality is, unless you tell people the, the bad news first, you'll, they'll never really understand how good the good news is. And that's what Paul would do a lot of times. Matter of fact, it got Paul persecuted. I mean, the, that's the reason why Jesus went to the cross. He was killed predominantly. That was God's doing. That was, um, but uh, that's why they were doing that uh, against Christ alone, because he was preaching basically uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. And so, uh, so the Jews were, fr- uh, were, were mad or frustrated with him. The Gentile world was mad and frustrated with him as well. And so, um, so, so love is a key thing that we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Matter of fact, love is going to be one of the main characteristics as a disciple of Jesus that should be evident um, in our lives. Now, we talked about perseverance and long suffering being together, kind of closely connected, basically just having perseverance uh, to the end. Uh, we see the word persecutions and afflictions. And we've already talked about that a little bit persecutions and afflictions um, in Paul's life. And Paul had uh, multitudes of those uh, in, uh, during the course of his ministry, during the course of his life, that he uh, is like what Tracy said that, <clears throat> you know, in the same way that Christ was persecuted. Um, we also will be persecuted as well. The next one I'm going to look at is Timothy's life, just real briefly. Um, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 5 through 7, Paul says this, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, now he's, remember he's writing to Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you, through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So why do you think it's so important that Paul makes note that this genuine faith that Timothy possessed was in him? So Tracy said it was in an encouragement to him, Mike. So, Mike, and actually, if you look, I think, what was it, the ladies' group, but did you have verse 7 last Sunday? Is that the, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind? Is that the verse you had? One of the ones you guys had last week. So the women were talking about that. And so we usually will just look at verse 7 by itself. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. But like what Mike said in that section here in Second Timothy chapter 1, Paul is making mention uh, to, about Timothy's faith that it was in that was in him that it was a faith that uh, was given to him by his m- mother and grandmother. You can look at that in the book of Acts, but um, as well as here, is that God God was making a note that Timothy ne- needed, I think, encouragement. The reason why that we got verse seven here is where it says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. There could have been, like what Mike said, a chance that Timothy was kind of feeling a little little low, a little beat down because he's, he was a young man. Most people believe that Timothy was probably in his late teens, maybe early, early 20s. Um, whenever Paul uh, came through there, he was from the area of Lystra and Iconium in, in that area. Um, and then whenever uh, Paul came through on his first missionary journey, most likely Timothy was one of the people that heard Paul share the gospel, share about Jesus. And he talks about having this faith that was in him from his mother and his grandmother. So most likely what was going on was, was, and so I think this is an encouragement for us as well. You know, Megan, the responsibility that she has, I'm sitting here with, looking at Judah this morning. I'm not going to call on you, I promise. He's looking at me like, <laughs> don't, don't, make me, don't make me say anything. <laughs> but, the, but, the, no, but Judah, the reality is your mom does have a responsibility in sharing Jesus with you and raising you in your faith and uh, that you know that you're part of this you're part of this group of people just like everybody else in here um, that you're just part of who we are and so that's one of the responsibilities that your mom has and so we all have that responsibility if we're parents or grandparents as well um, 
that we that we pour our lives into the younger people. You know, if when we come together with Genesis Fellowship, um, one of the things that we're going to have is children's ministry. Um, I was talking with Steve here recently, uh, you know, about some of the different things, because and, and talking about the just the building and how it's all laid out and how we basically are. We're in a position where we can accept them to come in. We have the room. And so one of the things I think is going to be important for us, and once we see some third, we're going to have over 30 kids, which is a lot of kids, but I think that's going to be an awesome thing because each of us, we, not, we, we may not be like, say, this, uh, like I'm not Judah's father, but the, rea- but the reality is I can pour into Judah's life. I have a responsibility to do that. We all have that responsibility to pour into the next generation's life. And that's why one of the things, one of the things that's exciting to me is thinking about Genesis Fellowship, is thinking about the children's ministry, because that's the next generation that we're training up. That's the next generation that we share Jesus with so that they can take the message out. And so we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, as Paul is writing to Timothy there, um, most likely what was happening was, because he, he was younger, he was probably ministering to people that was probably his old enough to be his parents. Uh, but Paul made note about Timothy and called him his son in the faith. So Timothy was somebody that Paul... Uh, uh, really love. The next one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. It says, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. And so when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth there, um, he was talking about Timothy and talking about how he was beloved of, of Paul, that he was a faithful son in the Lord. Um, and so, as I was thinking about this, when you look at the layout of, of discipleship, whenever uh, um, we're training people up into the things of the Lord, it would go from Paul, it would go down to Timothy, and then it would go down to other people. So one of the questions that you can ask yourself is, who's my Paul? Like, who is my Paul in this world? Do you have, I mean, you know, for me, uh, I, I get together with a couple pastors uh, every other week or so, and there's a couple of those guys in there that, that I consider them my Paul because they're a little bit older than me. They've been in the faith a lot longer than I have. And so I look to them. I listen to what they have to say. And we can also say, who's our Paul, but who is our Timothy? And you look around, that's kind of your equals, so to speak. Um, who is it that, that, that I basically that I'm doing life with? And it's so vitally important for us to have that. And then the people that Timothy was training up is you can ask yourself that same question is, is you know, am I engaging other people in my life that are, that are younger than me? And so I think that as this merger comes together, they have a different age group of people coming over here that fits perfectly with what we have. Like I said, we average, our, our, our age averages somewhere in the late 40s to early 50s on an average. They don't have that, that kind of demographics of people uh, there. Uh, so we're going to fit in perfectly, and so we're going to have opportunities to have people that are older than us in the faith, younger than us in the faith, or maybe equal to us in the faith. And that's what Paul, as he encourages Timothy here in 1 Corinthians 4.17, that he was a beloved and faithful son in the Lord, uh, that he had the responsibility of training up um, other people. <clears throat> when Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 and 16, he says this, let no, one, let no one despise your youth. So that there might have been a possibility that people were despising his youth. Maybe they were looking down on him because he was a young man that kind of, like, kind of made it, so to speak. He, he, was, um, he, was, he was ministering for the Lord, and so maybe people were looking down on him. But Paul encouraged him not to let people do that or have people do that. But he says, but be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, then he says, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And so there's a pretty large section here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, that kind of it's a, a similar list that what Paul had as we was looking at 2 Timothy about Paul's life. Paul makes mention of some of the things that's going on in, in Timothy's life. So the first one we have there is, is the word word. So let no one despise, you, despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word. What do you think he's talking about in word? Be an example to believers in word.
Do you think it's the things that he's saying? His speech is... Actually, that's really good what Mike talked. What Mike just said, putting, your, putting word and conduct together, that basically the, that our conduct should match the word or the words of God, the words of the Lord. Um, I believe that he's referring to word here. Uh, believers in word could po- either be the, the way that he speaks, um, you know, because the Bible talks about, you know, profanity, that we shouldn't, that we shouldn't have profanity in our lips um, as Christians. Uh, so it might be the way that he is speaking. It might be the very word of God that Paul's talking about there. But his conduct... Uh, should be that which uh, is backed by the Bible. He, he says the same thing uh, that we looked at in Paul's life in 2 Timothy about love, that, that, Paul, that Paul's telling Timothy that he should have a love <clears throat> for other people. He should have a love primarily for God, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, um, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That, that love was evident in Timothy, Timothy's life. What do you think he means when he says in spirit? Be an example to the believers in spirit. Attitude. Do you think he's referring to the Holy Spirit here? I don't. I don't think so. I think it's like what I think. What actually is really good. What you said is his attitude, the way that he lived his life, the attitude that he had was right, and so that, that he's to, to be an example to the believers in attitude or in spirit, in faith. Uh, obviously, uh, um, Timothy's faith in the Lord Jesus and his purity. What is purity? If somebody says you live a pure life, matter of fact, it's one of the exhortations that we're given in the Bible uh, in 1 John chapter 3, that we're to purify ourselves just as he is pure. So what, what Mike had to say... Uh, is so true. It's, he's most likely talking about. Um, actually, I was just trying to look it up real quick. It's First Thessalonians chapter four, um, verse three. It says, "For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality." And so, and that's and that's First Thessalonians four, verse three. So we see what the will of God is for our lives. It's sanctification. What does it mean to be sanctified? We're, we're, so we're thinking about the word purity right here in First Timothy four. What's that? Yeah, that's good. Yep, yeah, that's one of the definitions for sanctified is to be set apart. That I don't partake or I don't go do the things that everybody else does. I'm I'm kind of set apart. And we see that here in First Thessalonians chapter four that that's the will of God is is sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Why does you think Paul, as he's writing to the church there in Thessalonica, why do you think he's making mention of sexual immorality as being the main thing that will uh, kind of discredit you if? if you're caught up in doing the things that you're not supposed to be doing. Why do you think Paul is telling us here in 1 Thessalonians that sexual immorality is one of the main things that God looks at? So Mike's right about that. He talks about this being a sin against the body. That everything else that that we can do as calling it a sin is outside the body. So I think one of the things too is um, that kind of a lifestyle was prevalent during that time period, especially during the, all the different gods that they would have worshipped and served and bowed down to. There had been temple prostitutes that would uh, take place and worship and therefore worship of God through this sexual immorality. And so that's one of the things that, um, that Paul kind of makes mention to Timothy about here in first Timothy chapter four is it being an example to the believers in purity, the way he lives his life, that he's pure, that he's not defiled by anything, especially when it comes to sexual, um, immorality. And then the last verse, and we'll kind of close with this. We'll get to Epaphroditus next week. So is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Uh, that's one of my favorite verses because what it does is it shows you the, the hierarchy of discipleship. So we see here that Paul is writing to Timothy. Then Timothy, he, he has to find faithful men that can train up others. So there's a fourth generation of people. And that's 
one of the things that I think we've talked about with Genesis Fellowship, and Jim, me and Jim, I know me and Jim's talked about this, is that when we look at this combining of the two churches, we're looking at the long term. Not the short term. I mean, the short term, obviously, we're, we're all going to get along. We're going to be the church together. We're going to grow in, in, in a different way. Um, and, and most likely, uh, this church has members that have gifts, too. And so their gifts are going to help edify and strengthen us. Um, so it's vitally important. Uh, that, that, but it's vitally important. It's, it's important that I train Judah. Or this church, we're going to go out of existence. I need to train Judah. I need to train Mason, Tanner, and Kenzie. They're young, they're young couple. Rachel, Xander. I mean, they're, we're, he's all, they're all a part of this church. And so as they begin to grow uh, in their faith with Christ, it's so vitally uh, important. We see this in the life of Paul and Timothy, that Timothy uh, was looked at highly by the, by the apostle Paul. But he, he was exhorting to, uh, Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 to find faithful people that you can entrust doctrine to, that you can entrust teaching to, that you can entrust the things of the Lord to. You know, when I sit here and I look at Tanner, I mean, Tanner, what are you, 26, 27? 27, 27 years old. He's a young man. You know, he's the, he, he, he might be up here one day. Who knows? Um, you never know what God might do in his life. And so that's why it's so vitally important for us as we move forward with Genesis Fellowship um, is to look at this as a good thing because we're looking at the long haul of the church uh, that we're going to have younger people. And maybe, you know what, Judah, you might be the preacher. What do you think about that? Here's, how many? Fifty years, you got to be in your family. You might, you might have to be in your fifties. I'm, I'm going to get you. I'm going to take you like Paul took Timothy because he was a young man. When you when you get to be about sixteen years old, I'm going to take you underneath my wing and I'm going to start training you up for being a pastor. What do you think about that? It's fine. That's right. <laughs> With that all being said, hey, let's let's come to a close. We'll look at Epaphroditus uh, next week out of the section in Philippians chapter 2, because he's one of the ones I really like. I love looking at the life of Paul and Timothy as we're looking at in, in Philippians. Um, but I, I like to look, look at his life, because Paul had some really positive things to say about Epaphroditus uh, in this letter. I know I've mentioned it a couple of times here, but the, you know, the, the merging of the two churches, just keep that in your prayer. Uh, they're praying, we're praying, we're trying to discern and try to do this the right way. Um, you know, I was, when I was standing back there when Tim was leading in worship, I was thinking about what it's going to look like to have, uh, you know, different folks that we're going to get to know different people. And, and, the, and one of the things that does stand, does stand out to me is that they are going to have different gifts than we have. And they're going to be able to minister those gift, gifts to us. And so and we can do the same thing uh, to them as well. And I think that God's going to do a powerful work in the life of this merger. So just keep this uh, in your prayers. <clears throat> Let's close in a word of prayer.